Hi there and welcome to the Stock Club Podcast, coming to you from the top floor of my Wall Street HQ here in Dublin, Ireland. I'm James and with me this week is my Wall Street co-founder and chief investor Emmett Savage and our head analyst Rory Caron. In this episode, we're talking about the effect of the coronavirus on the stock market, asking if Shopify is overpriced and picking the companies we think will be the next 10 baggers from the My Wall Street shortlist. Okay, so before we start off this week, Emmett, I want to come to you first. In our final episode of last year, you made the bold prediction that we'd see um, a lot more um, bricks and mortar stores close this year. And it seems like your um, your prediction's already coming true. Macy's announced this week that it would be closing 125 stores over the next three years at last loss of uh, 2,000 jobs. Yeah, and it was a safe enough prediction because yeah. I think my 2018 prediction for last year was uh, we'd all have a VR headset. <laughs> yeah. So I decided to completely lowball it this year. Um, it's uh, it's not a prediction I relish in getting right. It's, yeah. it's an unfortunate outcome. I think that uh, going out shopping has a social quality. It creates employment. It keeps an area vibrant. It keeps shopping malls going. But alas, that's just the way of the digital world. Yeah, we're definitely moving. Rory, we, we'll come back to you maybe in a few months about your prediction with Beyond Meat. Give you a yeah, bit more time. Yeah, give me a bit of time off on the... <laughs> um, Beyond Meat prediction. Although I did, when I was I was writing an um, update on the Nordstrom uh, comment that we have in the app, and I was looking at Nordstrom versus Macy's in particular, and, like, the reason they're closing stores is because there's just way too many of them. They have so many stores. Yeah. that They have, like, yeah. 800 or something stores across the US, and the US has the highest ratio of consumer shopping space per capita in the world by far like twice as much as other development or five times as much as Japan wow. and Crazy. France like wow. is how much actual space is dedicated to shopping malls and strip malls and that yeah kind of so, so there's a lot in that yeah. so moving on then um, since the start of the year all talk across the news has been dominated by the coronavirus um, the market hasn't been immune to this either with shares in US listed Chinese companies like Trip.com and Huazo Hotel Group getting hit hard um, a few weeks back. It's kind of the, the effects have spread out to other companies with strong Chinese presences like Starbucks, Nike and Tesla recently with them all issuing warnings with their quarterly reports um, for impacts from store closures and manufacturing declines and things like this. I, I don't want to get too much into the nitty gritty of the coronavirus but we often talk here about how investors should, should re- react to market panics and downturns in the market. How should we react when there's a global panic that tangentially affects the market like this, Emmett? Yeah, and it's like, I suppose, a rising tide. There's very little you can do about it if we see panic. Panic is panic and there's not a lot we can do to change the actual effect. But the only thing you can change at moments like this is your own perspective, your own behaviour, and to realise that panics have existed since the beginning of records and long yeah. before it. And uh, this particular panic, I have to admit, has made me sit up straight uh, uh, to the point where yesterday I, I actually ended up speaking with uh, an infectious disease expert. Okay. Um, in preparation <laughs> really, for this. Really doing your research <laughs> I suspected podcast. you were going to ask. And, and um, I, I really had two questions like, what is a virus? And, and more to the point, how does it stop? You know, because uh, really now, I guess the world's question mark is how is this thing going to come to an end? Yeah. And I was quite curious about that because, uh, you know, all things come and go. Uh, and if one happens to believe that coronavirus is not the absolute end of humankind, which I certainly hope, we all hope it is not. Um, I was keen to know how will this virus arrest? When will it yeah. stop? So, I mean, a virus is a small parasite that cannot re- reproduce itself. So basically, it infects a susceptible cell uh, via RNA and DNA. And as you said, let's not go too deep into that, lest I unveil how absolutely ignorant I am on the subject. <laughs> but coronavirus is now traveling faster than SARS. Okay. Uh, and quarantines and travel bans halted SARS in 2003 and the microbe was eradicated. Uh, but that possibly is looking increasingly unlikely today. Yeah. Uh, the, you know, the genie's out of the bottle, like, yeah. like coronavirus. And, and the world is, has changed massively in the 20 years, kind of, or, or nearly 20 years since SARS was a, was a thing. It is, absolutely. I think uh, coronavirus now in four of the five continents, it's, yeah. uh, it's out there. And it joins four or at least three other coronaviruses. So it, it's not that coronavirus is absolutely 
new to the human or the, the animal kingdom. It's just that uh, it, this is the fourth one and this one is obviously taking centre stage at the moment. So what we're seeing is the emergence of a new coronavirus that might become just another seasonal pathogen, which causes pneumonia, mm. comparable to seasonal flu. And I think we were chatting there earlier, James. Well, I know we were chatting earlier. I think what you said <laughs> was that uh, at this moment... Yeah, the, the according to the CDC, about 10,000 people have died this flu season. So, yeah. you know, if you're, if you're comparing them, it, it's still quite in its early stages. And yeah. I suppose flu doesn't get as much of a centre stage because, you know, everyone knows the flu and everyone gets the flu at some stage in their life. Yeah. So what it looks like we're dealing with is a virus that a vaccine will be developed for. Uh, that we may all end up taking. I yeah. don't know, I doubt it. Uh, but I think that this is news at the moment. Clearly it is news at the moment and, and it's affecting certain stocks. And, you know, we, we spent the week debating what companies might uh, rise and might fall from the advent of, of coronavirus. But the only fact is that it will someday be uh, history as much as news. Yeah, and, and it's funny, Rory, it seems that every company nearly is, is factoring the effects of this into their earnings. You know, there's a lot of companies reporting earnings at the minute, and I know Starbucks definitely, and, and Tesla as well, warned that there would be a material impact the next quarter because of this. Yeah, well, as you said, like, it's a much different situation than it was 20 years ago. It's when SARS was the big story, you know, China is now the second biggest economy in the world. It's the largest outbound travel market in the world. There's major American corporations all very highly dependent on revenue coming from China. Starbucks is a huge one. Nike's a big one. Apple, obviously, yeah. you know, it's where they make all the iPhones. Tesla had to shut down, um, delay their launch of the Model 3 and have closed a lot of their stores. So yeah, it's just going to have a much bigger financial impact than in SARS would have had 20 years ago. And yeah, I mean, look, you know, companies are always going to hedge their future performance when they have an opportunity to. Yeah. Um, you know, you used to joke about the restaurants all saying, well, the weather's not looking well for the next quarter, so... They used to blame the way Easter fell a lot too. Yeah. That was, uh, <laughs> yeah. Like, the, you know, uh, uh, the investor relations guys working in a company will take any excuse they can to give a reason why they're not going to perform quite as well as the market thinks they're going to perform yeah. in the hope or mm. that they will, that nothing will happen. So yeah, it's always just, you know, it's just to let you all Guys, no, perhaps we won't do very well. <laughs> yeah, it's easier to tell them now and, and overperform later. Moving on to perhaps a, a lighter subject, the Super Bowl was on last Sunday, and Rory, you wrote a really interesting insight this week about the Super Bowl effect on the market. Yeah, some well, it's not necessarily effect. It's called the Super Bowl indicator. Okay, I remember reading about this years ago, and I thought it was kind of kooky, but it's uh, people do actually listen to it, or like certain Wall Street investors do actually take it quite seriously. Um, <laughs> It was discovered, for want of a better word, by a sports writer in the 1970s who had looked back over the stock market and whether it went up or down and realized that any time a team from the NFC won, the yeah. stock market tended to go up. And any time a team from the AFC won, the stock market went down. It was a bit more complicated <laughs> than that, actually. Yeah. It, was, it actually depended on what leagues they were playing in before the a NFL was formed, but not to get too bogged down, like 40 times out of 53 that this has been measured, it's cor it's correct. Okay. It's a 75% success rate. It's not bad. Uh, no, it's pretty good. <laughs> and there's like, like I said, there's Wall Street investors who, who literally do take this into account when they're making their investments. <laughs> now, admittedly, a lot of them accept flat out that there's no logical reason for this to happen, but just that it works. And so they, they use it as an edge. Um, hasn't worked in the last four years. Okay. So you would have done quite badly over the last four years if you'd used this as a as an investment thesis. Uh, last year when the Patriots won, that was supposed to indicate the market going down. It actually went up like 30%. Um, but like, it's just, it seems crazy. It? Like, why would the stock market care what the football <laughs> team is? Not only that, why would it care what league a team was in 50 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's really just trying to find patterns in the madness, isn't it? Yeah. I think it's a Hunter S. Thompson piece. Is it like, did he write that? I wonder if, it, as in his sports journalism days. Yes, potentially. Like, but yeah, investors are always looking for these like secret tricks, you yeah. know. Yeah. Um, sell in May and go away. That's <laughs> yeah. an old famous one. Just proven September, well. September sell off, was that one? Uh, yeah, there's, there's yeah. always the Trademark. When they come back from their holidays, they, they re reorganize their. Uh, <laughs> 
their holdings. Mm. Is that one? I thought that that's was the was rumor for sure. Yeah. Um, I think certainly sell in May and go away was completely disproven. The sets the January indicator was another yeah. one. Whatever yeah. way January goes, that's the way the rest of the market. There was one I remember researching a few years ago as well. It was called the Santa Claus Rally. Now I can't for the life of me remember what exactly it was, but it was something to do with Christmas and the yeah, market. It's sort of like psychological thing where people just spend more and yeah. in, around mm. the holidays and then yeah. like it'll filter mm. down to investors. Yeah, it's all a bit, a bit of nonsense. Anyway, the Kansas Chiefs won. <laughs> so, uh, Mark's going down. Mark's going so, down. Save stocks. <laughs> that explains that. <laughs> uh, moving on then. So, as I mentioned, we're in the middle of earnings season at the moment. And when Alphabet reported their earnings recently, we got some extra information we weren't maybe quite expecting. They broke out their YouTube revenue for the first time ever. So, we found out that YouTube ads generated $15.15 billion in revenue for fiscal 2019, with close to $5 billion in the fourth quarter alone. Um, Rory, why are Alphabet choosing now to release this YouTube uh, revs? Well, they've been under pressure for some time to release this. The SEC has been on to them multiple times saying, like, look, you need to give us better view of where this revenue has been generated. You've got a website, which is the second biggest website in the world, second largest search engine in the world, clearly generating massive amounts of money through ad revenue. And you're refusing to tell investors how much revenue or, or what it contributes to your, your company. And for years, Google kind of used a loophole where they said that, you know, Larry Page is our CEO and Larry Page is the chief uh, decision maker in this company. And we don't tell him what the <laughs> YouTube revenue is now. Do you believe that? I don't know. Mm. Like they say they didn't. I could potentially see Larry Page just not caring. Yeah. You know, he doesn't care about advertising, does he? He just wants to fund his little crazy projects. Um, but they did admit that they told Sundar Pichai the YouTube revenue numbers. Okay. So when Larry Page stepped in last year and Sundar Pashai was made CEO of Alphabet, the entire company, there was no real way they could get around saying, well, we don't tell Sundar Pashai. They knew already that he yeah. he had those figures. So they kind of had to. Yeah. And um, they're kind of getting out ahead of it now before the SEC starts pushing on a little bit more. Um, it, it's quite interesting because... Y- you know, for such a, a massively recognized platform and brand, we don't, we never knew that much about YouTube because they were bought quite quickly by Google after they were founded. I think it was 18 months or yeah. so. So, th- so they didn't exist by themselves that often. And like, it, it's, it's quite, quite funny thinking now, now is the only, the first time that we're actually getting to dig in behind the, the platform. Yeah, I know. It's weird that the company that has that much influence, like it, it is a public company in a way, it's a subsidiary of Alphabet, yeah. but it's like public. You can invest in it uh, through investment Alphabet, but yet we knew so little about it. There was all that kind of pub trivia knowledge that we had of, about YouTube, like how the their hours first, and <laughs> yeah, their first landlord is the CEO and all this stuff. But like we never actually could dive into the business. And unfortunately, we kind of still can't because they only gave us the top line revenue figures. Um they didn't tell us anything about, you know, how what their gross margins are, what their operating income is, how much they pay on royalties to artists, how much yeah. they pay content creators. Like, it's very hard for us to use this information in any way. The, the only thing we kind of do know is that it's, it's making $15 billion a year in revenue and it's growing really fast. So it grew 35% this year and it grew 37% the year before. So it's fast moving in terms of the, the, the ad spend that's going in there. But yeah, I mean, like you, even the bandwidth that they sp- must spend on keeping those videos yeah. online must be huge. So we don't even yeah. know if it's a profitable business. It probably is. But like, mm. you kind of wonder, like, why are they hiding it so much? Why so much obfuscation? You know, a, yeah. if you've built a good mouse trap, explain how the mouse trap works. Exactly. Yeah. And content moderation was another expense I, I immediately thought of. You know, you, you hear about Facebook so much recently these days, um, you know, spending a lot of money on, on moderating the content and, and getting a lot of flack for the mm. way they treat their content moderators and I maybe not to the same extent but YouTube definitely have have come under fire for the, the content they allow on their site recently. Yeah we've talked about it on this podcast a couple of times and, and probably you know is, is there a company that you could possibly compare YouTube to if you were to take YouTube's singularity it's probably Facebook is nearly the, yeah. the closest comparison in terms of kind of size and and the way that they break down their how they earn money essentially, yeah. it's it's eyeballs essentially is mm-hmm. their is their product. Um, so yeah, if you were, I mean if you were to take uh, YouTube, like this is so back of the envelope and it doesn't <laughs> it like it means so little, but like Facebook's trading at like nine times sales. So if YouTube traded at nine times sales, they'd be like a hundred and twenty five billion dollar company. Yeah, but that's we just don't mm-hmm. know. It's so hard. There's such a massive range 
of what that company could be worth. Do we think they'll ever delve into more detail? I suppose I they don't have to. I would say though the SEC will push them a bit harder. Okay. This is the first step in, in what will be full disclosure at some point. Mm. Okay. So just before we move on, I want to remind you about all the great stuff you can find in the My Wall Street app at the moment, including our brand new Stock of the Month report. I also want to let you know about a really cool new resource we have available at the minute called the Invest 2020 Toolkit. This is a special one-off bundle that contains all the resources you need to get yourself in great financial shape for the year ahead. As part of this package, you'll get access to a 12-month guide to the perfect portfolio, a never-before-released video where Emma talks about his strategy for the next market downturn, and a special one-off podcast episode where Rory and I pick the top three stocks to ride out 2020's hottest trends. You can get all of this and more for just $59. However, the sale was supposed to end yesterday, but we've decided to keep it over for just one more day until tomorrow, Saturday, February 8th. Get in before then to get this Invest 2020 toolkit before it's all gone. So let's move on to the company we never talk about. Um, this week's suggestion for the company came in from a long time um, listener, William McNamara, and he wants us to talk about IMAX. Hi, Max, indeed. Hi, William. So uh, IMAX is, I think, as most people know, uh, is a movie theatre company. And the desire to increase the visual impact of film has a very long history. The silver screen has been around for around a century. And IMAX has now emerged as the standard for maximum fidelity. Yeah. So when you go to see a movie at an IMAX theatre, you're basically getting a far bigger screen, higher resolution, uh, better sound, usually superior seats, and sure enough, a higher ticket price. So I think anyone who's lived in a city has at least noticed an IMAX theatre and they come in all shapes and, and, and large sizes around the world and, and occasionally have a very impressive architectural aesthetic. So IMAX are a brand that's known, they're a brand that's seen, they very often plant themselves in the most conspicuous location and are easy on the eye from the outside and, and I guess even easier uh, on the eye once you're inside. So before I plow on, here's a quick question for James and Rory as complete guess. How long has IMAX been a public company? What do you reckon? It's I really, have no idea. I feel um, like it's been a long time, like 20 years. I would go higher. <laughs> if it's not gesturing to me at all. Uh, <laughs> what, 25, 30 years? Uh, well, actually, in front of story, I'm going to give him the prize, even though you're closer. <laughs> <laughs> 26 years, that surprised me because yeah. uh, you wouldn't think that it's a business that's floated over a quarter of a century ago. So, you know, IMAX has longevity, has pedigree, and today has 1,473 commercial theatres okay. in 81 Globally. countries. Yeah. Globally, exactly. So in America, there's about 400 IMAX theatres. In Europe, there's about 200 IMAX theatres. But in Asia, there's almost 800 okay. IMAX theatres. So here in Ireland, I think there's one uh, on Parnell Street. Yeah, I think that's, that's <laughs> um, the amount I'm aware of. Or O'Connell Street, but uh, I've, if I was at an IMAX theatre, it was to watch kind of a National Geographic movie about mountains, and it really, we didn't. I've never been to a, a proper movie, if you like, in an yeah. IMAX theatre, so I really am speaking about the business from a um, an observational perspective. I guess... When you look at IMAX, it has not performed well over the last five or so years. I mean, it's historic high as a share price was around 43 bucks. It's sitting around 16, maybe 17 bucks at the moment. So what I did in assessing IMAX yesterday was, you know, I look across my, I guess, vast landscape of sales over 25 years. And the vast majority of sales I made from my portfolio were made in my first 15 years as an investor. And in that period, I certainly had the knack for selling at the lowest point when disillusionment <laughs> was at a peak. So I have developed an aversion to sales um, and supplemented, I guess, with a ton of reading and thinking. So with that in mind, when I look at IMAX, uh, in the good old fashioned way yeah. that I've always done. I see a lot of numbers that I particularly like, such as cash equals debt. Um, there's surprisingly high insider ownership, okay. around 16%. There's a decent enough return on equity at 7% and a very low five-year peg ratio or price to earnings growth ratio of 0 0.46, which is a number popularized by Peter Lynch yeah. in his book, One Up on Wall Street, which basically said if the peg was less than one, you're looking at a business that's trading at a discount or is good okay. value. Yeah. It's, I guess it's it was designed to add some 
depth of insight to the P ratio. Yeah. So you take the P ratio and divide it by the growth, anticipated growth over the next five years. There's a couple of numbers who look that look not so great. Um such as top line growth is mm. is in at five percent, and okay. that's very uh, low. Really. That's boring. Yeah. I mean, that's boring. A top line growth of five percent, no matter what way you cut it, mm. is not a growth business. So you can see why the stock price has slowly trended down from whatever it was forty three bucks almost five years ago. Yeah. Um, so I guess what we what I think we need to do when we're assessing IMAX is walk away from the numbers for a moment and, and jump to the right side of our brains and, and figure if IMAX has a strategic advantage and a product that the world will want more of yeah. in the years ahead. And obviously enough home TVs are bigger, better, cheaper. You know, everything uh, has yeah. been supersized. And um, the choice of providers of programming has gotten wider and better. And we've spoken about those so many times, Netflix, Disney, Apple TV. So you can stay at home and watch a giant... A, TV bigger than you've ever had before, with possibly better programming you've ever had before at a price point that's cheaper than your parents paid. Yeah. So home entertainment is going gangbusters and I guess you could say is improving by the hour. And that is, I would regard as the principal competitor okay. to going yeah. to the movies, staying home. Yeah, naturally enough. But with a straw poll of one, just thinking of myself, you know, if there was an IMAX theatre near me, uh, I would go and see all my movies on it. Okay. Um, because going to the movies is an event for me and I think for my peers. You yeah, don't well, we were talking about the kind of retail environment there at the start yeah. of the show. And, and I think kind of going to the cinema is is an experiential thing. You, you know, is, you yeah. can obviously the, the cost of Netflix for a month is cheaper than one cinema ticket. It often, is, yeah. But it's something I quite enjoy doing as well, going yeah. to see big releases. And if you're going to uh, to see a movie and you have proximity to IMAX, you know, that I personally would be willing to pay double the ticket price yeah. to go and see it on this super giant screen, very often curved screens. Um, you go and see the new Star Wars movie or if Avatar 2 comes out and it was in IMAX, I'd be on the front of the line to get in there. Mm. So for me, it's an event-driven purchase. I can stay home and watch movies or go out and make an event of it. So so from the right side of your brain, you do see a, a future for IMAX, a, a future purpose for a company like IMAX. I do very much. But what's concerning me is there's no apparent positive trend or okay. catalyst for growth. Okay, That's the big kind of elephant in the corner. It's just the numbers speak, you know, tell the story. 5% top line growth is boring. Mm. I went through the investor relations pack and there was quite an analysis of their strategy. It was a little bit complicated about how deep into the supply chain they've gone and vendor lock-in and, you know, Rihanna recorded a video at IMAX and there was an awful lot of, I felt, um, I suppose there was a lack of clarity. Okay. So what would you be looking for then to, that would kind of spark your interest again yeah. in IMAX, like a new product release or, or a new kind of strategic shift or something like that? Well, for me, uh, the jury is very much out yeah. for IMAX, I have to say, yeah. because I, from the right side of my brain, I do see it as a, the formula that's got a, a far bigger competitive moat to others. Okay. So you actually, if you are going out, you're going to go and pay that little bit extra. Now yeah. this, you know, actually, I wouldn't mind asking you guys, let's just pick numbers to go and see a movie you're keen to see. Is it 10 euros? Hmm. Would you spend 20 euro to see a movie you're very keen on in IMAX? Would you pay uh, double? Um, yeah, I mean, like, I don't go to the kind of films that would be IMAX films. Yeah. If that makes sense. Like, I yeah. don't go to the, the big action movies. Right, films. the yeah. kind of Avenger films yeah. and stuff. Mm. They are the ones that strike me as IMAX. But if I was, I probably would spend a bit more. I suppose, like, it's a big event. If yeah. You're into one of those big. Avenger movies, but like, yeah, yeah, the Oscar movies don't really need to be on IMAX. <laughs> and I, I spoke with Luke, our producer, who uh, is an avid attendee of movies. Thumbs up. And um, Luke, would you spend more on an IMAX theater? Yeah, he would. It's not a firm only. Nod of the head, so yeah. I, I know it's all. I mean, certainly these few anecdotes don't make for data. The, the bottom line is IMAX is not growing, which is a real pity. But I do see its place in a future where home is home. Yeah, and you'll have it as 
good as you want at home. You'll have the most perfect screen, best resolution, perfect sound, comfortable seats, all the content in the world. But going out is going out. Yeah. Sometimes you just want to go out and sit there and be entertained and you don't want to go to Broadway. You just want to have something bigger than at home. And I really do like the IMAX story. I just wish there was something there that was going to boost it. Well, for one thing, I'm glad they're getting, uh, I've noticed 3D is gone pretty much at this point, which <laughs> yeah. was the stupidest thing it was. ever. I hate yeah. it. Yeah. I was like, why are you making me watch this in 3D yeah. with those stupid glasses? Isn't there not a thing that every, like 3D has, has the technology has existed for decades, oh, yeah. like, since like the t- 20s or 30s, and they keep every 10 or 20 years, they keep trying to make it happen and They're it just doesn't happen. they trying to shove it down our throats for <laughs> decades. It's just another way for cinemas to make money because they yeah. charge five quid more for this That's 3D right. thing. And a friend of mine who goes to the cinema a lot and goes to see a certain type of film that I wouldn't normally go see these kind of mad, stupid blockbuster action films. He goes to one where the seats move. Yeah. Like, and 40, 40, 40, 40, 40. Yeah. And, and then like squirt, squirt water in your face. That's right. I know, face. yeah. And I was like, what the? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like hell. So, so that's our company we never talked well, about. Well, yeah. And, I, uh, by the way, I didn't really conclude very well, yeah. I suppose. I, I like IMAX. Yeah. It but would you're, not, you're waiting to be more inspired yeah, with them. Yeah. It would not make my top 20 list of investments, you know, if mm. I maintain such a list. I suppose I do. It's called my portfolio. But, um, yeah, I, I I want to like it. I want okay. to see it grow. I do believe it has a place in the future. Uh, I don't think home entertainment will be the death of IMAX. I just think it really needs to concentrate where it's rolling out and really get the best movies and not just the ones that are uh, superhero v superhero. <laughs> needs to get Rory's demographic. <laughs> uh, so that was IMAX, the company we never talk about. Let's move on to Jargon Buster. First question comes in from Stephen via email and he asks, what does it mean if a company is trading OTC or over the counter? Emmett? Yeah, sure, I'll take that. So an OTC uh, trade or o- OTC share, if you like, doesn't take place on either of the big exchanges or any of the big exchanges, such as the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ. Uh, generally, an OTC stock is a smaller, more liquid, less heard of, more volatile and unquestionably far, far, far riskier stock. And a company basically goes for an OTC flotation mm. because they don't have to adhere to the rigorous governance and standards that are demanded of the big, yeah. well-known exchanges. Okay. So uh, it's a faster way to list your company. And as a result, um, I don't know if you can get a drive through OTC. That might be a business model. Get your OTC listing done in a drive through <laughs> But um, I, I think OTC is... Uh, is one we, I think, just en masse, just ignore. We yeah. don't look at OTC shares for all the risk profile they carry. And and how, how would one go about investing in an OTC share? Like, would major brokers carry them or...? Yeah, major brokers, like some of the giants carry them. So if you go to TD Ameritrade, mm. uh, which is, I'm sure, one of the three biggest uh, online brokers in the world, that you can buy OTC okay. uh, on some of the big brokers. Okay. But, you know, limit orders are an absolute must if you really feel you have to go with OTC. When did you find anything special about OTC, Rory? Um, I mean, pretty much the same thing you find out. If you yeah. like, if anyone watched The Wolf of Wall Street and yeah, didn't see it exactly. as a portion retail, <laughs> like, and you're, you're yeah. thinking of investing in penny stocks. I mean, you're all adults, so I'll tell you not to. <laughs> this is it. Just yeah. a ridiculous idea. Ridiculous. Like they, there's no, the very little regulation on them. The ones that trade on the pink sheets that aren't. So there's kind of there's actually two markets. There's what's called the OTCBB, which is actually run by N- Nasdaq, and then there's pink sheets ones. The ones on the OTCBB do have some form of regulation, like they actually do need to at some point give you some financial information. Mm. The one on the pink sheets are just oh, like, pink sheets are lethal. Like they don't have, they don't have to tell you anything. Nothing. They could just absolutely br- like nothing. Make up stuff. Yeah. There's no one watching them. Yeah. And. The worst thing I've ever heard, I've had users contact me and say, I'm thinking of investing in this stock. I'm like, why? I'm like, well, it's at one cent, it can't yeah. go lower. It's like, trust me, it can. <laughs> yes. If a reverse stock split, it can go much lower. <laughs> Just because it's at one cent doesn't mean it can go lower. Yeah. Like, it's it, yeah, it's a mess. <laughs> and by the way, according to Nanoa of all things, the internet, uh, here are the largest OTC companies of 2018 in descending order. Okay. I know the first one, guarantee you. Go. Tencent. <laughs> Bitcoin Investment Trust. Really? Bitcoin Investment Trust. Now, you know, I, I this was a straw poll of one uh, website. Oh, really? <laughs> I looked, I googled. <laughs> so I know Tencent is listed over the counter. 
in America. You can buy 10 cent shares. It's like, there's a couple of big companies that actually do list over the counter because they couldn't be ours. Uh, okay, well, you see my, my source, which will rename, remain nameless, uh, <laughs> has a different list. But it's Bitcoin Investment Trust, Columbus Gold, uh, Excelsior Mining, First West Virginia Bank Corp, Mason Graphite, uh, Namaska Lithium, Smith Midland <laughs> Corporation, Suncrest Bank and Village Farms International. I heard of Village Farms International. Is it a cannabis but, company? Uh, is it a cannabis company? I don't know. I've just heard of it. It's set like what it sounds like they're all those kind of mm. uh, hype companies like yeah. Bitcoin. Lithium. Entirely. I know, but like gold. there's, yeah, gold. There's ones, um, Nestle are listed mm. on, on, on over the exchange in the States and Bayer, the big German chemicals company. Ah, so, you can, so I suspect my list is companies whose only listing oh, right, okay, is OTC yeah. because I know Nestle uh, are listed in Europe. Yeah, yeah. No, these yeah. are like the, the foreign companies yeah. who want to trade in America. But and can't be bothered with an ADR, yeah. right? Okay, interesting. Uh, moving on, Rory, I'm going to throw this question to you from Gordon. It's a short one. Is Shopify overpriced? Oof. Tough one. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we recommended it like tenfold ago. We thought it was, might be overpriced. Elevenfold, elevenfold, <laughs> elevenfold. Yeah, yeah. Got it. we thought it might be overpriced. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. Look on traditional metrics. Yeah, it, like if you looked, if you were like look at a couple of companies and go, not knowing the company at all, and say, is that mm. all right? Like it's at fifty-one times forward earnings, thirty-eight times price to sales. But like you know, if you're going to try and value an unconventional company with conventional metrics, yeah, like yeah, you're never, completely. you're, you're going to lose, like not necessarily lose money, but yeah. you're gonna, you could potentially miss out yeah. on a major growth stock. So yeah. Shopify is one of those businesses that you kind of just you, you almost have to give them credit for things they haven't even done yet, hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah, like yeah. just because they've, you know, this is a company that. Amazon tried to get into the space and yeah. decided not to bother because Shopify was so good at it. Yeah. Like there's so much opportunity for them in the future. They're growing the revenues at like 45% pretty much consistently year over year. Uh, 42% of that revenue is subscription revenue. So it's, you know, coming in every month mm, for yeah. them. Big cash generator. There's over a million merchants on their platform. Uh, almost $15 billion went through the platform just last quarter. And mm. um, and that's up 48% over year, year over year. And like now they're doing things like they're building a fulfillment network to better compete with Amazon. They're like expanding their presence in the, that value chain. And they've got a visionary founder who has built, a, you know, $50 billion business from scratch. Yeah, so, yeah. If, you know, you went through this. Netflix yeah. was overvalued for yeah. 20 years. It well, still is overvalued according is. to people. So is Amazon. Yeah. Like, you know, there's certain businesses that... If using traditional valuation metrics on is yeah. just a waste of time because Couldn't they're growing more. so fast and they're investing so much in the business that you really can't yeah. kind of look at them that way. You really have to take more of a holistic view of what this company could achieve further down the line or what the opportunities are for them to grow further. So, yeah, it's overvalued, but I might still invest in it. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> completely, completely. So speaking of Shopify then, um, the company recently became the first 10 bagger in the My Wall Street app, which means it, it grew tenfold in value since we first selected it back in 2016. Am I right? 17? Yeah, seven, maybe early 17. Maybe, yeah, maybe mm. it was January 17. Um, so this is obviously quite a rare thing to happen, especially in such a short space of time. So <laughs> this week's elevator pitch is, what stock do you guys think has the potential to become the next 10 bagger? And that's all we've time for this week. <laughs> <laughs> this is probably the question most people will want to know the answer to. Yeah. What stock do we think is going to grow to? What's going to make me money, pretty much? <laughs> okay, my crystal ball first or yours, Rory? You go first. Though. I'm going to leave you um, a minute. A minute, okay. So... What I'd say about it in 10 years from now, there will be several 10 baggers from the My Wall Street stock in a month. And in 20 years from now, there'll be very many. So it should be easy enough to pick one. Uh, so to answer this, I'm striking the 10 stocks in our app valued above 250 billion as tenfold from these starting points is not easy. So I've struck Apple all the way down to Coke. Uh, and then I harbor a belief that 10 baggers are easier to identify from the B2C world our business to consumer companies as you don't need uh, so much specialist knowledge uh, and then finally I prefer companies valued between 2 billion and 15 billion because statistically they're in pole position for a 10 bagger so melding all of that together and looking into my crystal ball the stock that I'm going to go with with 15 seconds to spare <laughs> is Teladoc 
Tell us. Yeah, and I should mention uh, that two weeks ago we were going to have this pitch um, to which I decided Tesla was the answer. And I still think that it will be the first trillion dollar company, uh, I guess, car company of our lives, which means it would be a seven bagger from today, but would have been a <laughs> ten bagger had we done this two weeks ago. Yeah, I do feel like um, I kind of robbed you of a, of a great um, pick there because we were supposed to do this two weeks ago yeah. and we didn't have time. And Tesla has gone up how much in the last two weeks? Uh, it's gone about 50 doubled fold. anyway. <laughs> So that's Teladoc, you think? I think, is going yeah, to be next I think Teladoc ten-bagger. is potential 10 bagger. Yeah, big fan of Teladoc. Uh, Rory, one minute. Yeah, uh, Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I was going, I mean, Shopify? <laughs> no, actually, I think uh, there's a company we, re- we just added, I think, less than a month ago now called Stone Co., um, which is the square of Latin America. We've got one of their competitors in there called Mercado Libre, which has been a really great stock for us. But this is smaller business. It's only eight years old. Uh, it's currently sitting at a $10 billion valuation. They've got 420,000 active clients, and that's growing at 83% a year. Warren Buffett, who, well, it wasn't actually him who invested, but Berkshire Hathaway owns 5% of it, for, and that's a very unusual investment for them. They're usually a lot more conservative with their investments. Um, I think it's just a brilliant company. It's based in Brazil. They're you know, they're at the forefront of the change or the war on cash in Latin America. There's 210 million people living in Brazil, so it's a massive market. And I think they could potentially be a $100 billion company in 10 years. Wow. Okay. Mm. By the way, completely agree. Completely agree. <laughs> so we're all yeah. in agreement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Uh, so that's about it from this week's Stock Club. Um, don't forget about all the great new stuff in the My Wall Street app at the moment and our Invest 2020 toolkit, which you can get until tomorrow. If there's anything you want us to discuss or explain in the next episode, please make sure to get in touch with us. You can find us on Twitter. That's at My Wall Street HQ. Or email us at pod at mywallstreet.com. That's P-O-D at mywallstreet.com. Don't forget to subscribe to Stock Club 2. And if you're enjoying the podcast, please leave a review for us. That's it from us here today. We'll talk to you in two weeks. Happy investing. Mm-hmm.